Hey guys, I just got back from vacation and I haven't been in my garden for two and a half weeks. So I thought this would be the perfect time to show you how easy it is to maintain and reclaim a garden that you might have not been looking over for a little while. And just kind of the key tasks that I'm going to be doing as I look to bring my garden back into tip top shape. This isn't going to be something that's going to be overwhelming or take a long time. These are tasks that you can do in a couple of minutes every day. Welcome back to my channel, but I'm going to welcome myself back to my garden. We've been gone for two weeks and some change. We had a lovely trip to visit some family that's over in Israel. And then while we were there, we also went to Rhodus, Greece. It was absolutely beautiful. Spent a lot of time with family, spent a lot of time in the Mediterranean Sea and the Aegean Sea. And overall, it just so many wonderful memories were made and I'm glad we went, but also I've been a little bit nervous about coming back because I haven't left my garden alone for this long before in the past. And so I figured it might be fun for us to walk through and see what my garden did while I was out and kind of make my to-do list for what I need to do to get my garden back in a tip-top shape. So let's go take a walk. So I'm going to start here in the vegetable garden because it's kind of the first thing that I do when I go out on my morning walks and I'm just kind of taking you with me and taking inventory of what happened while I was away. So I can tell that we had some storms while I was away because things look a little wonky. So Sushi is also checking out this blueberry bush. This is my first sign that there was some sort of storm. As you can see, this blueberry branch is completely snapped in half. Things like this happen, it's not a big deal. The blueberry will survive. All I have to do now is just take my shears or my snips and prune away any damaged branches. From there, the blueberry will recover. This is just, I guess, nature's way of pruning. So another sign that there was a serious storm is that this tomato trellis system, which has been standing here for two years now, um, has taken a hit. So I will say that nothing in my garden is perfectly straight or plumb or square, but it was never this crooked. And while I do think that some things being a little wonky adds a lot of character sometimes, this might be a bit much. So structurally, that is something that I'm going to consult with my personal garden carpenter on how to fix, aka my husband. So I'll consult with him and see what he wants to do. This isn't my forte. Mostly this is my forte. So I'm not gonna show you how to fix a trellis system right now until I figure out how to do that, but I will show you what I'm going to be cutting back and pruning to minimize the diseases that I'm seeing in the tomatoes from spreading and infecting other tomatoes. So while I was away, it looks like a lot of things fell in the garden and helped themselves to it. Let's start with the pests and then we'll move to diseases. If you ever see a tomato that looks similar to this, you can bet your butt that there is a tomato hornworm nearby. Tomato hornworms are caterpillars of the five spotted moths and they will decimate your tomatoes if left unchecked, as you can see here. Army worms have also found my tomatoes. If you ever see tomatoes with these tunnels like that, likely that is an army worm. These next tomatoes, I'm going with either a squirrel, bird, or chipmunk. Clearly, I've been feeding the neighborhood population while I was out. So in terms of pest control and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to call and pull everything that is damaged. I will give them to the chickens to enjoy. I don't spray or use seven dust on my veggie garden. Reason is because my kids and I, we will just take from the garden and snack. And so knowing that this area is clean, I have to worry less about that. If you choose to use that in your garden, you can. You can use BT for the caterpillars, that takes care of them. I am just out here pretty frequently, so when I see signs of damage, I am on top of it and hand pick. But you do you in your garden and whatever makes it easier for you to grow your own food. One thing that I do do that makes it easier for me to keep more of my tomato harvest is to harvest tomatoes when they are at the blush stage. 
basically they are less attractive to your birds, squirrels, chipmunks, and different types of pests if they're not a bright, shiny red. And they ripen off the vine just as well as they do on the vine, indoors, on your counter, and you get to keep more of your harvest. So for me, that's how I keep more tomatoes in the garden without having to use pesticide. Now let's move on to the tomato diseases that I'm seeing in the garden. So the yellowing leaves that you're seeing right here, that's a sign of wilt. I can't tell you if it's bacterial wilt or fungal wilt, but it's some sort of wilt that will likely spread from tomato plant to tomato plant. So what I'm gonna do is remove these leaves and get them away from the rest of the tomatoes. You can see here a close up of what tomato wilt looks like. It's very difficult to discern whether this is from a fungus or from bacteria. And honestly, it doesn't really matter because there's nothing that I can do at this point. The best thing to do is to try to contain the spread and that's just by removing the leaves and by throwing them away. This isn't something you wanna throw in your compost pile. This is something you wanna throw in your trash. If you're seeing signs of wilt in your tomatoes and you live in a humid climate like I do in Atlanta, it's pretty normal around this time of year, July, to be seeing that. Honestly, tomatoes can produce all the way until your first frost, which in Atlanta, we have a really long growing season. Our first frost typically isn't until October or November. So if tomato wilt didn't exist, these would keep producing well into that time frame because different types of wilt is so prevalent and they are very likely to attack your tomatoes. My tomatoes typically will produce until maybe the end of this month. If you wanted to extend your tomato season right now, you can go back in time about a month ago and start a second round of tomato seeds. That way, once these are pretty much ready to cull, you'll be able to plant out your new tomatoes and reset your season. Or you can go to your local nursery and grab a few starts from there if they still have it. If you have a really long growing season, that way you kind of get two rounds of tomatoes. I love tomatoes, but I start to get lazy in the garden around this time of year. What I'm thinking about now is starting seeds for the fall season. So those are your cool weather crops, your kales, your lettuce, your broccoli. I'm thinking about those now and not so much another round of tomatoes because honestly, this time of year, I am overwhelmed with tomatoes and getting a little bit sick of them. So um, that's where my head is at. But if you want a, a second round of tomatoes, that's what you can do right now. My garden carpenter fairy wizard man came to my rescue and he thinks that we can put this back together just by tightening the screws. So I am doing what I do best, which is holding things for him to work his magic on. And as you can see, I'm a very excellent trellis pusher and proud of the fact that I can push a trellis so dang well. So all it took was tightening up the screws on all four sides and it worked. As always, he has a disclaimer. I should keep it together for the season. The better fix would be to do diagonal supports. That'll help if it shakes back and forth. Okay, so this is the last thing I wanna talk about and then I'll get away from the veggie garden space and move into the landscape space and show you what's going on over there. But any sort of zinnias that you're growing, I wanna pull one over here. It's so gorgeous. If you want these towards the fall as well, this is another thing that gets prone to diseases and will kind of start dying back. Now is the perfect time to sow another round of zinnias and also go ahead and deadhead any blooms that are starting to go to seed so that these plants keep producing more blooms instead of seeds so that you can enjoy them for longer. Okay, let's go check out the landscape. So one of the first things that caught my eye right when I got home was this Japanese anemone patch is back. I spent a really long time trying to remove every single piece, but it looks like I left a chunk because this entire patch is back with a vengeance. Japanese anemone spreads through rhizomes. Newer cultivars and varieties aren't as aggressive spreaders, but this one is definitely very aggressive and very hard to pull up. This might be a situation where I need to use Roundup in the garden. I rarely use it, but I'm on my last straw. Definitely make sure that if you're planting Japanese anemone, that it is a newer cultivar that does not spread like wildfire. I don't want this video to be all doom and gloom, so I do wanna share something positive with you. Before I left, I whacked back the yarrow pretty hard. I 
thinking behind it was by the time I get back, likely things will be butted up and recovered from a pretty hard prune. So might as well do the prune now and see beautiful flowers when I get back. And that's exactly what happened. Now here's an example of a yarrow that I didn't cut back and you can see how it's completely flopped over. And now that I'm back in the garden, it looks like a hot mess. The other yarrow that I did cut back looks absolutely beautiful, quite the difference. So lesson learned, before I go on a long vacation, I'm going to completely prune back all perennials. But right now, I'm gonna take care of this really quickly. This is new vintage violet yarrow. It does spread a good bit in my garden, but it's pretty easy to control. Unlike that Japanese anemone, this yarrow has a beautiful purple color normally and the blooms then fade to this light pink white as they age. So you can see these are really old blooms. All I'm doing now is just completely cutting back the yarrow to the base. If I had more time and wanted to be a little bit more selective, I could just deadhead and likely would have blooms repeat faster, but I'm ready to just get this over with because as you can see I've got a lot of things to do in the garden now that I am back. Okay I cut everything back to the base. Everything had kind of flopped over. It was getting way too long. Sometimes it's easier to just start fresh, cut back your perennial to the base, then try to hand pick the buds that might be growing up. Uh, there's still plenty of growth at the base so I'm not worried about it but things that flop over in the garden drive me crazy. Speaking of things that flop over in the garden, let me show you one more thing I'm going to cut back now. This massive eucalyptus looking shrub behind me is pink lemonade baptisia. It's actually not a shrub, but a perennial that dies back to the ground every year. And it's actually one of my favorite perennials that I look forward to seeing every year in bloom. This is pink lemonade baptisia. It is absolutely stunning. It is very, very upright once in bloom, but once it forms these seed pods here, it really tends to flop over in the garden. I have underplanted this Baptisia with Shasta daisies. You can barely see them now, but once I cut this back, you'll be able to see the Shasta daisies and I'll be able to kind of reclaim this space and clean it up a little bit. Last year was my first year ever cutting back Baptisia before the foliage started to die back. I was personally very, very nervous about it, but I figured the worst that could happen is I would go out and buy just one more perennial, which, you know, what's the harm in visiting the nurseries and checking out what's in stock? So all that's to say is that I cut this back last year in July. It came back obviously just fine this year. So this year I'm not hesitating to cut it back as I know it'll be just fine. So let's cut this back together real quick. So what I'm trying to do is really just cut out those main branches that have fallen over to the front and are covering up the Shasta daisies. That way the Shasta daisies will get the sunlight that they need to grow and bloom and be happy and I can have some blooms in this space again instead of all of this foliage. So honestly I think this is a personal preference. This looks like a great mounded shrub. I just have it in the wrong spot likely. I'd recommend a perennial like this in the back of a border. That way when it flops over, it just looks like a really healthy shrub with beautiful silver green foliage. Here I have it kind of in the middle of a border and because of that, I really am missing those blooms this type of year. I might evaluate moving this in the future and just keeping a patch of Shasta daisies and adding in a few other perennials that'll bloom earlier in the season and later in the season so that I just have constant blooms in that area. It's something I'm going to think about this year, but for now I'm going to be doing this annual cutting back of Baptisia to make space for Shasta daisies so that I could have blooms in this part of the garden during this time of year. And here's the after. I left the stems that were more upright and now the Shasta daisies have some sunlight so that I can get some more blooms in this area. Like I said, I might evaluate moving this to another part of the garden, but for now, this works. And here Sushi is really modeling and demoing what Shasta daisies would have looked like if they had had enough sunlight. These are planted literally 10 steps away to the right. So guys, your perennials need sun. This is a clear demonstration of what they could look like if they had sun. 
Moving on to the side garden, I set up this little watering system that now I need to put up and I wanna tell you about it because I think it saved all of my citrus that I have growing in containers. So now it's time to put up the sprinkler system. I set this up so that all of my citrus that I'm growing in containers could be automatically watered as well as this little cut flower garden. I posted a short on this as well and I'm happy to report that none of my citrus died this year and I think it's because I set this up. We had really hot temperatures, obviously some storms too, but I think this ended up being clutch for when we were out of town. Also, if you're interested about learning how to grow citrus in containers, I am super passionate about it and I've got quite the collection going, even though I don't live in a zone that can support growing citrus, that's why they're all in containers. Anyways, I have a YouTube video up on it. We'll put up a link right there. It's very easy and rewarding to grow citrus in containers. Watch that short video and you'll see how little care they really require and how absolutely beautiful and delicious they are. Also, while we're here, let's do a mini tour of the cut flower beds. These are a couple of beds that I just started in ground this year. Lots of zinnias and celosias. Apparently it's the year of celosias, did you know that? Also amaranth is beautiful and dahlias because what would a cut flower bed be without those beauties? Also, if you can believe it, when we left, these sunflowers were this big. I planted out baby seedlings and look at how tall they are now. I'm floored, one of them is about to bloom. I absolutely love sunflowers. That's another one of those flowers that you can start from seed right now to have sunflower bouquets in the fall. Okay, right behind me is this Vitex shrub that I trained tree form. Clearly it's turning more shrub form right now and the blooms are all bloomed out. This is absolutely one of my favorite shrubs. In some areas it's considered invasive and it does spread through seed. So I am very diligent about cutting this back also, if you cut this back after it blooms, it will bloom a second time for you, which is a win-win. So I always like to cut this back as soon as I see that the blooms are all bloomed out. And then I'm going to remove any of the new growth that's growing at the bottom so that it looks like a little tree again. So to be fair, this really isn't post-vacation garden cleanup. It's really just things that I do this time of year in July. If you have a Vitex, it's just something that you have to do this time of year. I could have planted a Japanese maple or another small tree in this space. In fact, we're actually thinking about maybe switching it out for something that would produce fruit, like a cherry tree that has low chill hours. But for now, as I have this Vitex here, this is going to be a July chore. But if this isn't your cup of tea and you'd rather not have to prune and deadhead a small tree, then plant something that doesn't require it. I just happen to have this in the garden. It has very, very beautiful blooms. And so, so for me, it's worth it. And I enjoy pruning and deadheading. But if you don't, definitely look for different varieties that'll give you a similar shape and form and structure in the garden. And here's the after Vanna White style. Well, now I'm gonna address a question that you might be thinking about, which is where are all the weeds in your garden? Did they get out of hand? Did I come back to a jungle? What does it look like? So I'll take you through a couple of beds and I will show you the weedy ones and then also some beds that actually look pretty good and what I think is responsible for them looking pretty good. So the area around the chicken coop is one of the most weedy areas in the garden that I came back to. I'm growing a very diverse amount of weeds here forming quite the ecosystem. It's pretty impressive. I also have a lot of weeds on this slope and other weeds around the playground space and around the compost pile. And all of these areas, what they have in common is a lack of mulch. Perfect example where the space on the left is mulched and has less weeds where you can see over on the right, they are thriving. So I think the mulch was definitely very clutch in preventing the weeds. Obviously, it's not financially feasible for me to mulch my entire space. So I prioritize places where I've created garden beds and planted perennials. Those areas I mulch and then the areas around the playground, around the chicken coop, around the compost pile, I pretty much just have to hand weed. So what I do is just stay on top of it little by little as much as I can. I set a timer for 10, 20 minutes and go out and weed a section and you'll be surprised how quickly all of those small little sessions add up into a weed-free garden. 
I feel like weeding isn't a super sexy topic to talk about, but just in general, a couple of tips to help you with weeding is that number one, if you can weed after a rainstorm when the soil is nice and moist, it makes it so much easier to pull up those weeds. In terms of tools, I mostly just use these. I have bought this uh, weed picker thingy in the past. I rarely reach for it or use it. I don't know why. I just seem to use my hands just as well. I do use this tool right here. It looks a little excessive and it kind of is, but it is amazing for weeds with long tap roots like dandelions. It really just takes care of it so quickly. It's very easy to use and great for people that might have back problems or mobility issues in the garden. It just makes weeding so much easier. I feel like this whole video has turned into look at all these things that I have to do to maintain a garden, woe is me. So I really wanted to feature something incredibly beautiful that I do absolutely nothing to every year. Those are limelight hydrangeas. This incredible show is really all limelight hydrangeas and no me. The only thing I do is cut it back once a year, which if you know kind of shrub upkeep and maintenance, that's a blessing. So once a year in early spring or late winter, I will cut back all of my panicle hydrangeas, including limelights. I don't fertilize, I don't water, and this happens every year. It's one of those plants that once you plant it, you let it establish, you get to sit back and enjoy this magnificent show for years and years to come with very, very little work. Um, and I feel like that's one of my favorite parts of gardening. You get to transform your space around you with relatively very few dollars, depending on the size that you plant. These were tiny one quart plants and look at them now. They're absolutely epic. They're beautiful. I could go on and on about gardening and get mushy, but I'll stop now. But I just wanted to share that gardening is not all, you know, tons of work and tons of maintenance. There's also so many times that you get to sit back, look at your garden and go, wow, I can't believe, I can't believe this is mine. I can't believe I transformed my garden into something like this. It's just incredible. So I hope that was helpful. I hope that maybe I was encouraging. The whole point is just to get out there in your garden, even if it's just 15 minutes a day or whenever you have a chance, that's likely enough time to keep on top of your garden, even if you've been gone for an extended amount of time. When you break things up into small increments, you're able to see big changes with minimal effort in the span of just a few days. So I wanna thank you for watching this video. Thank you for supporting my channel. If you like content like this, I hope you will hit the subscribe button and follow along with my garden journey. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you in the next video.